everybody. Welcome to my Shalom Zone. My name is Sherry Dawn, and it's my great honor and privilege to get to share this grace encounter with you today. Don't forget to hit like and share. Never miss an opportunity to spread the gospel of grace. Decree with me. The Lord gives wisdom. Out of his mouth comes understanding. I will hear what the Lord says to me. And I will declare that decree. Amen. You have to make up your own mind to speak in agreement with the words of God and then let Him establish the promises that those words convey to you. Now, in March of 21, uh, I had a vision and a dream two nights apart. And I recorded them, you know, prayed about them off and on, but never really got all that much understanding on them until I was just kind of thumbing back through it today while I was eating lunch and looking at some things. And the Lord just quickened this to me again. And it started off a chain reaction. <laughs> so I've spent several hours studying and receiving the things that he was wanting to share with me through this. And so I'm going to share that with you. Now, in the vision, uh, I had been having just a very, very fitful night. I mean, it was awake and asleep and awake and asleep. And, but one of the times when I woke up, I was fully aware that I was awake. But then I saw this rushing, swollen, turbulent river, and it was right at my feet. And the, the weird thing about it was that part of it was very muddy, and part of it was just almost clear. But the odd thing about it was that the clear and the muddy were not mixing. So it wound up almost looking like patchwork with sections that were clear and sections that were muddy. Now that happened on March 15th of 2021. Then on March 17th, I had a dream very, very early in the morning, and I'm just going to read you as I recorded it in my prayer journal. This morning, I dreamed of a muddy creek at my feet into which several family members were jumping to frolic and play. I took off my shoes, intending to jump in and go wading. So I did, but before I took two steps, I looked down, and the water was clear I saw a chunky necklace with a pendant. It was black and silver in design, very pretty. And as I reached to pick it up, a man appeared and told me it belonged to his girlfriend. I replied that I was moving it out of the water because my family was playing there and I did not want it to get trampled or broken. I hung it on a branch and woke up. And so, you know, being the wonderful spiritual person that I am, I said, Lord, what's up with the muddy water this week? <laughs> Bless his darling heart. He's going to get me raised one of these days. He said, storms stir up silt. In both the dream and the vision, the clearing up was becoming apparent. And so I thought about it for a minute. I thought, yeah, it was. It, it, it was a progression. It was getting more and more and more clear. But in the dream, he continues, the clearing up occurred after the family jumped in the water. And I said, yes. He said, Ezekiel was a priest, and I had him wade into the water until they became waters to swim in. I said, yes, I was familiar with that scripture. He said, you've been calling forth righteousness as a mighty stream. That stream overflows the hiding places and cleanses don't be dismayed by the mud. It is being moved. So, in light of the things that have happened in this last year, that really began to minister and say a whole lot to me. <laughs> so, this is my understanding. Both the vision and the dream, the muddy water was at my feet, meaning I was going to be walking through this. It was right there in front of me. There was nowhere else to go. Going to be walking through it. The deal is, is that when water is muddy, you cannot see what it covers. And if you can't see, the result becomes confusion and uncertainty. 
and it takes boldness to jump in anyway. Now, there's some areas I'm pretty bold. Walking in muddy water where I can't see what's going to be flipping around my feet, not one of them. Okay. <laughs> so when I'm, you know, when you see me jumping in muddy water, your hand of the Lord's on me. The necklace uh, is an ornament for the neck. And I know that silver represents redemption. The man just appearing out of nowhere and telling me that belonged to his girlfriend finally connected the dots and realized that that's compared to Christ and his bride or his fiance. And it, but it was hidden until the water cleared. And when I pick it up and I hang it on a branch, which seems, well, that's just weird. It belongs around a woman's neck and I'm hanging it on a branch until he reminded me that he's the vine, we're the branches, we're also the bride. The family playing and enjoying the current instead of being dismayed or terrorized by it represents the family of God and their behavior in what seems to be a crisis situation. They are choosing to enjoy and persevere and not be moved by the fact that the water's muddy or that it's at near like flood stage. Let me read you something out of Isaiah chapter 28, verses 2 through 6. This is the scripture that immediately came to mind when I, I was looking at that muddy water and he said something about it overflowing, uh, the righteousness overflowing. Isaiah 28, verse 2, Behold, the Lord hath a mighty and strong one, which as a tempest of hail and a destroying storm, as a flood of mighty waters overflowing, shall cast down to the earth with the hand. Now again, when you see hand in reference to the Lord, remember his hand is also his spirit. Because when Jesus was casting out the devil and they accused him of doing it by Beelzebub, one of the gospel records him saying, if I cast out devils with the finger of God, another gospel records him saying, if I cast out devils with the spirit of God, by whom do your sons cast them out? So hand, finger, spirit. When you're talking about God, it's all connected. So he's got this storm this mighty strong one, which as a tempest of hail and a destroying storm as a flood of mighty waters overflowing, shall cast down to the earth with the hand. The crown of pride, the drunkards of Ephraim, shall be trodden under foot. Crown signifies rulership, dominion. And notice that it's pride that God's after. This dominion of pride that has been over his people. And the glorious beauty, which is on the head of the fat valley, shall be a fading flower, and as a hasty fruit before the summer, which when he that is looketh upon it seeth, while it is yet in his hand, he eateth it up. In that day shall the Lord of hosts be for a crown of glory, and for a diadem of beauty unto the residue of his people, and for a spirit of judgment to him that sitteth in judgment, and for strength to them that turn the battle to the gate. Now always, always, always remember, that one of the first promises made in Scripture to Abraham regarding his seed, speaking of Jesus, is that his seed would possess the gates of his enemies. And Galatians chapter 3 lets us know Jesus is that seed of Abraham, but it also lets us know that we become the seed of Abraham in Christ Jesus. So possessing the gates of our enemies, that's a big deal with God. He prophesied it and he told the end from the beginning. And so now he's letting Isaiah see that he is going to be the, the spirit power behind what we're saying and doing that's going to cause these things to come to pass. And when you need strength to turn the battle to the gate, that means the enemy has already gotten inside and you're having to push him out and shut the door in his face. Well, it's much easier to keep an enemy from getting in than it is to rouse them out after they've gotten in. And this is the situation where we are right now. The enemy has made great inroads and he has, you know, conquered a lot of territory and he's boasting about what all he has done and what all he's going to do. But God has declared, I'm going to be strength. I'm going to be the spirit and strength for them that turn the battle to the gate. So this storm of the spirit, this hail, this flood of mighty waters and the scripture tells us in the gospel of john chapter 7 verses 38 and 39 that 
he that believes on Jesus, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. And the scripture says that this spake he of the Holy Spirit, which they that believe should receive, for the Holy Ghost was not yet given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. So it's no coincidence then that when we go on and read further in Isaiah chapter 28, we find out about praying in tongues, speaking in tongues. Isaiah 28, verse 9, Whom shall he teach knowledge? Whom shall he make to understand doctrine? Them that are weaned from the milk and are drawn from the breast. For precept must be upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little and there a little. For with stammering lips and another tongue will he speak to this people, to whom he said, This is the rest wherewith you may cause the weary to rest, and this is the refreshing. Yet they would not hear. And we've seen that this has been true down through the centuries. Uh, the gift of praying in tongues. I mean, God would not give us something that had no value. And this is so priceless because there's so many different things that happen simultaneously as you're praying in tongues. You're building up your most holy faith. You are praying out the mysteries. The love of God is being shed abroad in your heart. You are um, declaring the wonderful graces of God. You're, you're speaking directly to God through your spirit, even though your understanding may be unfruitful. You're entering into rest. That's what he said. This is the rest and the refreshing. So the enemy has tried to make speaking in tongues or praying in tongues or singing in tongues seem like something that was just woo out there because he did not want the body of Christ to understand the value of what they had been given. And that's changing. People are realizing the value of what they've been giving. All right, let's go on down to verse 16. And he's picking up his narrative again regarding this. And he says, Therefore thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I lay in Zion for a foundation, a stone, a tried stone, a precious cornerstone, a sure foundation. He that believeth shall not make haste. Now, if you go on over and you look in the scriptures in First Peter, you find out this is talking about Jesus. So this, everything we're about to read is in regard to after Jesus has come. Judgment also will I lay to the line and righteousness to the plummet and the hail shall sweep away the refuge of lies and the waters shall overflow the hiding place. And your covenant with death shall be disannulled and your agreement with hell shall not stand. When the overflowing scourge shall pass through, then you shall be trodden down by it. Now, our national covenant with death was disannulled when Roe versus Wade was overturned. And one of the things that brought that about was that the prayers of the saints were causing the rivers to flow out of our bellies to flow rivers of living water. And there were people, I mean, they've been praying for years and years and years about this. They've been praying for years about the evil that has flooded into our country. And they're meeting flood with flood, the flood of the Spirit. But those Rivers are rising, and they're flooding, and they're overflowing the hiding places, and they're stirring up the silt so that it can be dislodged and removed. And in the process, the body of Christ is learning to be carefree and to trust the Lord and to trust the process, as well as finding out that they're having things revealed that belong to them that all of that muddy water had been covering up. Now, we know that necklaces are for wearing around the neck. I want to read you some things out of Scripture regarding the neck. Proverbs chapter 3. I want to read verses 3 and 4. And I don't mean to get on your nerves, <laughs> but various different people watch this at various times, and some of them have not heard me say this before. But when Solomon asked God for wisdom, and God was so pleased by that that he gave him wisdom and then he also gave him riches and fame and all these sorts of things. But when we read the book of Proverbs, we have to understand that these are concentrated capsules of wisdom directly from the heart of God that were given to Solomon. So we pay attention to this. And in Proverbs chapter 3, verse 3, he said, Let not mercy and truth forsake thee. Bind them about thy neck. Write them upon the table of thine heart, so shalt thou find favor and good understanding in the sight of God and men. 
So mercy is from that beautiful Hebrew word chesed, and it means goodness, kindness, favor, loving kindness, beauty, pity. In other words, it just means everything that grace is. And he says, let this mercy and truth, don't let it forsake you. Forsake is from the Hebrew word azab, and it means to loosen, that is to relinquish, to forsake and refuse. Well, why, why would we want to be so sure that mercy and truth, that we're hanging on to it, that we would bind it around our necks? Well, for one thing, Proverbs 16 and verse 6 says that it's by mercy and truth iniquity is purged. Now, everywhere we look, we see the fruit of iniquity on a rampage. And if you're, you know, sound mind, you're not happy with that because it's hurting everybody. And we don't like that. But we can't just jump up with legislature and making demands and chewing each other out and name calling or using force. That does not purge iniquity. It just creates more. It takes mercy and truth to purge iniquity. And that mercy, he said, it means grace. So then when we read in John chapter 1 and verse 17 that grace and truth came by Jesus Christ, that lets us know that the only way we're going to see this stuff changed, to see it overturned, to see the kingdoms of this world become the kingdoms of our Lord, is by doing it His way. And it takes mercy and truth to purge iniquity. So we don't want to cover it up. We don't want to sweep it under the rug. We want it purged. We want the silt out of the water. <laughs> okay. <laughs> he said, let, mercy, let not mercy and truth forsake thee. Bind them about thy neck. Neck is from the Hebrew word. I, I, I know I'm going to slaughter this, but I'm going to try to say it. Uh, Gargaroth. And it means in the throat as used in rumination. Well, rumination simply means chewing the cud like a cow or a sheep. But to ruminate for a human means thinking about it, talking about it. Ruminate means to think on, to ponder, to turn it over in your mind, to chew it again, think about it, speak about it. So what this is saying to us is during this time when things seem all in a turmoil, I mean, that in that first vision that I had, the water was just rolling and boiling and it was nasty and right at my feet, couldn't avoid it. We don't want to make the mistake of thinking, oh, I've heard about grace. Let's go listen to something else. Or, oh, I've heard about righteousness. I'm tired of hearing about righteousness. Let's talk about something else. I've heard about redemption. I know all about redemption. Jesus redeemed me. I'm redeemed. I can even sing the song, I'm redeemed. Don't make that mistake. Don't let mercy, chesed, grace forsake you because it's by grace we're saved, healed, delivered, rescued, protected, preserved, and made whole. Keep these in the forefront of our thinking. It's too easy when the water's muddy to forget these things and to start thinking and talking like everyone else, to start leaning to our own understanding and trying to find natural carnal solutions for spiritual problems. And it absolutely cannot be done. If you go on down to verse 21 of the third chapter of Proverbs, third chapter of Proverbs is so good because it's all about the wisdom of God and it's just rich. Every verse is just rich. Verse 21 says, My son, let them not depart from thine eyes. Keep sound wisdom and discretion. So shall they be life unto thy soul and grace to thy neck. Mm. Grace words are life to your soul. Life is from the Hebrew word chai, and it means alive. It means maintenance. It means merry, running, springing, lively, fresh. So all of my, my family acting like kids, jumping in, in that red muddy water, and then the muddy water becoming clean, that's a picture of that. That life, it's lively. Where children are, there's life, there's noise, there's movement. You know? um, and that's what he's saying. These words, they're life to your soul. So we want to be alive, merry, M-E-R-R-Y, as in full of joy, you know, delight. Soul is from the Hebrew word nephesh, and it means the breathing creature, the self, mind, 
body, breath. So shall they be life unto your soul and grace to thy neck. Now, grace is from the Hebrew word cane, and it means graciousness, kindness, favor. You cannot get around the word grace or mercy that's translated from the word said without favor. And that's the reason a lot of times I will go ahead and say grace is the unearned, unmerited, undeserved favor of God. Favor to means be on his good side. Favor means having his face towards you. Favor means having his blessing extended towards you. We have favor because we are in Christ Jesus. Now, why is the grace about your neck so important? Because in that culture and in those days, putting one's foot on the neck of one's enemies was a sign of total victory and domination over them. And the Lord wants us to understand when you have got grace bound around your neck, it keeps your enemy from dominating you. Now, if you want some scripture reference, Psalms 18 and verse 40, David was praying and he's or speaking to the Lord. He said, you have given me the necks of my enemies. In Joshua 10 and verse 24, whenever they were going in and doing the conquest, and there were some certain kings that uh, resisted them, and they put them in a cave and, and then had to go on and you know, take care of other business, and they came back and they dealt with these kings that didn't help them. And they put their necks, their feet on their necks. So this is a picture that's in Scripture. And God wants us to understand. That's what this necklace was all about. It was silver and black. That silver represents redemption. Redemption truths that are revealed as the mud is being cleared out of the water. As the confusion is being cleared up. He wants us to understand. You keep the grace and the mercy. Keep it in your mouth. Keep it around your neck. It's going to be life to your literal self, your literal soul realm. It's good for you. It's going to keep the enemy from dominating over you. He said, when you lie down, excuse me, then shall you walk in your way safely and your foot shall not stumble. Having grace around your neck is going to affect your walk. When you lie down, you shall not be afraid. Yea, you shall lie down and your sleep shall be sweet. Be not afraid of sudden fear, neither of the desolation of the wicked when it cometh. For the Lord shall be thy confidence, and shall keep thy foot from being taken. Mm -mm -mm. Don't be moved by the muddy waters. They are clearing up. <laughs> and God is revealing things about redemption that we, we never understood. If they were understood in generations past, they were lost. But they're being revealed now to this generation because now the redemption is nigh. It's time for it to be manifest more fully than ever before as the Lord pours out His Spirit in these last days. Well, we want to be part of that. So don't let the things that are happening in the natural get you so distracted that you forget to bind mercy and truth around your neck. That you forget to keep seeking out greater revelation on the grace of God and on the righteousness of God and on the redemption that is being made manifest in this time. When God promised that he would raise up shepherds that would feed us to the place that we were not dismayed, that we would not fear and we would not be lacking, I'll guarantee you those shepherds are going to be feeding their flocks grace and righteousness and redemption. Let me bless you. The Lord bless you and breathe fresh life into you today. The Lord strengthen you and inspire you with fresh hope and with bold faith. The Lord quicken you and protect you and your family from all evil as he raises you up to possess the gates of your enemies. As he causes you to prosper and be in health even as your soul prospers. May you live to be 120. I hope you said amen. Let us pray. Father, I pray for your people today. And I'm so thankful that you declare the end from the beginning and that you've already got everything that we need in place. But it's very dismaying to stand on the brink of a rushing muddy river and not have any understanding about what's going on. And Lord, I know that the enemy has just been talking nonstop. 
to try to cause your people to be dismayed and without hope, to be discouraged. And I just want to thank you for this reminder that you've already spoken into this. You've already made provision so that we don't have to be discouraged. So I speak shalom over your people right now in Jesus' name, and I ask you to minister peace. I ask you to continue to pour out your spirit upon your people and minister to them in dreams and in visions and impartations in their sleep and help them to understand you've got this and that you are working all things for their good. And whatever the enemy is trying to do, it's too little too late because the kingdoms of this world are becoming the kingdoms of our Lord. And Father, I just I praise you for refreshing in your presence. I praise you for the power of your Holy Spirit and the very life that's in your grace words being manifest in your people, quickening them, raising them up, causing them to be merry-hearted and to be frolicking like children when everybody else is panicking because they know the end of the story because their eyes see farther than the swollen, muddy rivers. And Father, I thank you. I thank you that you declared out of our bellies would flow rivers of living water. Encourage your people, Lord, to pray in tongues. Move all of the invisible hindrances that keep those that want to pray in tongues from praying in tongues. Move those hindrances so that they can, so that they can participate in causing the life and the love and the light of God to be kindled and to pour forth and to affect everything around them. Thank you, Lord, that you have made us stewards of grace, not stewards of damnation. Thank you, Father. Thank you for your great wisdom and for your love. We praise you this day in Jesus' mighty name. We receive it done. Amen. All right, dear friend. I hope you have an absolutely fabulous day, and I will talk to you later.